Well, good afternoon. Welcome to Preservation Connecticut's Fall 2023 series, Talking About Preservation, our noontime chats about everything preservation. I'm Jane Montanaro, Executive Director of Preservation Connecticut, and I'm pleased to be your host. Today, we're chatting with Travis and Felicia Gulick, representing Gulick and & Company and Smith and & Gulick, about making historic homes more livable. But before we begin, let me give you a quick overview of Preservation Connecticut. Preservation Connecticut is the statewide private nonprofit historic preservation organization founded in 1975 by a special act of the Connecticut General Assembly as the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation to preserve, protect, and promote the building sites and landscapes that contribute to the heritage and vitality of Connecticut's communities. We are statutory partners with the Connecticut State Historic Preservation Office, and I'm proud to say that for 48 years, we have successfully championed the protection of remarkable community assets all over the state by leveraging funding, advocating, forming partnerships, and promoting stewardship. Our office is here on Whitney Avenue in Hamden, Connecticut, it's listed on the National Register of Historic Places and designated as an official project of the Save America's Treasures Program. It's the Eli Whitney Boarding House and it has served as Preservation Connecticut's headquarters since 1989. We have a staff of nine preservation professionals and a board of 21 preservationists from around the state. Staff listed here are always available to assist with inquiries. Christopher Wiegren is our deputy director Contact Chris for information on historic, pre historic preservation easements, our bi-monthly magazine, Connecticut Preservation News, our Olmstead in Connecticut Landscape Survey Project, and to arrange book talks for his book, Connecticut Architecture, Stories of 100 Places. Renee Trubert is our Making, Place, Making Places and Preservation Services Manager. Please contact Renee for information on redevelopment of historic industrial sites, and tax credit applications. Jordan Sorensen is our development and special projects manager. Jordan manages all of our communications and outreach to members through social media and email, receives and monitors demolition notices from municipalities, and prepares historic tax credit applications and nominations to the state and national registers of historic places. Kristen Hopewood is our development assistant. She manages all of the inquiries that come through our website, provides member services, arranges special events, and is the editor of our Historic Properties Exchange, a free listing of threatened historic properties. And finally, our team of circuit riders, Brad Scheid, Mike Farino, Stacey Vero, and Stefan Danchuk, they provide immediate boots on the ground service to homeowners, developers, municipal leaders, nonprofit organizations and museums, historic district commissions, and much more with an array of preservation technical assistance, including community organizing, prioritizing maintenance and repairs, historic designations, funding, and archeology. span These chats started during the pandemic. They continue as an important tool for us to meet our mission. We're able to connect with the public and hear what's on your mind. Please feel free to use the chat feature to ask questions or ask questions directly at the end of the presentation. And of course, contact us afterwards for a call or a site visit. Many, many thanks to our business sponsor for today's Talking About Preservation, Hoops, Morgenthaler, Rausch, and Scaramoza, Attorneys at Law. And a preview for next week, please join us for a Halloween-themed chat, the Connecticut Witch Trial Exoneration Project. So with that, I am ready to hand the controls over to Felicia and Travis. I'll stop sharing and let you take it away. Welcome. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, we are very excited to be asked uh, to give this uh, talk. We're always um, happy to share our experiences and uh, our knowledge and of course uh, we're always learning um, every historic building is is its own uh, little time capsule so we're always learning about that uh, so I'm going to share our uh, PowerPoint we've gotten um, 
some questions in advance. So we're going to try to work that into um, our presentation as we speak. But of course, we're happy to uh, elaborate or take any questions at the end as well. Let me share this and let's see, how do I make you a slideshow? Okay. All right. So um, this is uh, our presentation on sympathetic restoration and design solutions for historic homes. Uh, my name is Felicia Smith Gulick. Um, this is my husband, Travis Gulick. Uh, I have a master's in historic preservation um, from Pratt. I grew up in a 1741 farmhouse outside of uh, Boston. Uh, and I've worked in commercial and residential project management for a number of years, and I also have an interior design firm. Uh, Travis Gulick, I mean, I own a company, Gulick and Company, uh, design and build. Um, we specialize in historic homes, um, kind of all on the shoreline uh, down here in Connecticut. Uh, I got my degree in historic preservation from Savannah College of Art and Design. Uh, I did an internship at the National Trust. Um, at the Abraham Lincoln's Cottage and in the public policy as well one summer. Um, and, you know, I was born right here in Madison. Uh, we own a house right downtown Madison where our office currently is, 1733 house. Um, and we actually owned a house ourselves, um, the 1710 Stone Shelley House in Madison uh, for a while as well. Uh, so we're all about the old houses and we love the character. Um, and try to preserve them as much as possible. It's the stories that go along with them. Great. Yeah, um, so getting right into it, um, I think we'll start with, whoop, of course it won't let me, there we go. So that's who we are. These are our two companies. Uh, we also have a custom cabinetry shop called Saltwood Cabinetry. Um, I think as many of you know who own historic homes, uh, storage solutions are always an issue. Uh, so that's where that came from. Um, all right. So oh, I skipped a slide. Uh, one of the first things that we'll just get into, why is this not doing what time. there we go. Um, so just a, a brief sort of introduction. Um, I think one of the questions was how do we learn more about historic homes and renovations? The National Park Service, the Secretary of Interior Standards, that's, um, that is sort of the overall philosophical guide guidelines. Um, that's if you're using tax credits uh, to do a full uh, renovation, restoration. Um, but, you know, it's, it's also good tenants for just general uh, residential reconstruction projects. Um, I kind of think of it as uh, the doctor's oath. You know, when you live in a historic home and you're renovating first, do no harm. Um, you want to make sure that you're not taking away any of the history, um, that you're not uh, making it unworkable or destroying it for future generations. You know, really, uh, we sort of see ourselves as stewards of these houses rather than owners. Um, but in the same vein of that, you know, you it's your home. You want to feel comfortable there. History doesn't happen in a vacuum. Your houses shouldn't be in a vacuum either. Um, so we kind of take that into, into uh, mind when we're coming up with a renovation strategy. And then of course, the thing that, that can be um, the most challenging with, with older buildings is complying with uh, modern day building codes and regulations and making sure that they're safe and um, functioning and all of that. So that can be a bit of an issue. So um, throughout this presentation, we'll talk about a couple of different um, <laughs> strategies, but we're we're going to use largely on um, the Stone Shelley House as our case study. As Travis mentioned, uh, we were the uh, previous owners, stewards of this house. Um, prior to our ownership, this house, um, as you can see in the original slide, was uh, listed on the Connecticut um, Most Endangered Buildings list, as you can uh, probably imagine why. Um, based on the before photos, um, it was fully renovated in 2008 um, about. by about roundabout there by <laughs> Gulick and Co. Um, so all new mechanicals, all new windows, insulation, roof, everything um, that you can imagine. So this is a great case study. And also 1710, you know, that that's a rare vintage. Um, you could see some of the, the very historic 
um, features on it. I also love the wave in the roof line that sort of indicates how the house was built onto over time. Um, if you ever want to do a deep dive, this is on the National Register of Historic Places. Really good place to start if your house is listed on the CT Register or the National Register because all of the research that goes into getting that nomination is, is a really good place to start to understand where um, the house came from and how it's evolved over time. And you always can use the Connecticut Trust really as a you know good good reference as well. They have a lot of stuff on their website and uh, the historic register as well, uh, the National Historic Register. You know, the aspect is with these old homes that you can see from the left-hand picture that this house was actually not even able to see. You didn't even know, it was, you didn't even know it was there and some were born. Um, and so this obviously is a little bit more extreme case study um, with kind of really with their elect house and you don't kind of get the, Whole aspect of demolition by neglect, you know, that's kind of always the scary part about these houses. People just let them go until, you know, you have to tear it down. Um, so it's always trying to get to those houses as fast as you can. And the other aspect is with um, what Felicia said was being a steward of it. You know, you have an old home. Yeah, it's going to be a little bit more time consuming to take care of, but you're not the last, you know, the next person's going to take it over and they don't want to have to redo something or, uh, you know, find something damaged. So, mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So um, first thing, normally when you're, when you're dealing with a historic home, especially one that's, that's been in this condition are, are envelope and structural concerns. Uh, so that's sort of everything um, from foundation to structural failures. If you have rotten the beams or if uh, somebody throughout the years has added a plumbing pipe and cut through a large structural beam, you're not going to know that until you start to see the sagging or cut into the walls. Um, rotten infestations, obviously, you know, that's, a problem in all houses in New England. Um, water intrusions, uh, windows and doors are a large part of sort of modern homes and bringing them up to codes and then roof lines and different materials for that. Um, so we'll get into a couple of different things, but I, I think the first thing we want to say is, is, you know, when, when people aren't familiar with historic homes, I think the biggest concern is, oh, it's a money pit and also it's drafty. And it, it doesn't have to be that way, um, as I think, as I think, you know, um, so the two biggest impacts that you can do to help mitigate those concerns are um, good insulation and weather tight windows and doors. And with modern technology, especially advances in the past couple of years in building materials, um, you can get pretty good insulation. Um, and then also that's energy efficiency, all of that. Um, and I think you think the one big thing that you can see really in this picture when you're going into, you know, old houses and everyone's like, oh, you know, oh, you have a rotted sill. You know, this is kind of really just shows this rotted sill aspect. Um, you know, oh, no, we have to take over the whole front building, you know, front of the house. We've got to take all the walls down. We've got to replace the sill. You know, I always get a lot of calls from realtors, you know, people looking at older houses and like, oh, you know, it's got some rot in the sill. We got it. And that's going to be a fifty thousand dollar job. You know, and the aspect is it's, you know, it's not true. <laughs> um, you know, we, we've done so many sill replacements that have been a weak job um, that you're able to access it from the outside. Um, and, you know, and it gets into that aspect of really getting someone who knows what they're doing with older houses and sales saying like they have to cut everything open to really access it. Um, you know, and additionally, when you're getting to the older house, and, you know, you kind of get the purest pure preservation, like, all right, well, when 1700s, they didn't have pressure material, uh, pressure treated lumber, you know, well, that's kind of goes into the fact that, well, if they did have pressure treated material, they would have used it. Um, and so that's what you can see here. They use a pressure sill, um, treated sill. Sorry, my office phone's ringing. Um, and that's when they would, that's when they would have used it um and so that that's kind of the other aspect with it um you know it's really making sure that you're we use today's products you know back back in the 70 oh well, you need a white oak sill well that's just going to rot over time eventually as well you never see a sill let's use materials that are going to last um and not use that purest form um obviously if you get in different aspects different grants different you know in the national uh the national historic preservation um aspect that gets a little bit different but for you know average day residential home 
you know, use today's building products. Right. It's a matter of philosophy. Um, our philosophy is, is that the better you take care of your house now, the bigger chance it has for surviving for multiple generations to come. Um, so again, going back to the history doesn't exist in a vacuum, houses don't exist in a vacuum. We'll get into that more when we talk about interior updates as well. Um, but in terms of structural, so insulation, a um, couple of questions on this. This is a good picture showing you sort of uh, on the original picture. That's all the old insulation that got taken out. And, um, you know, I think probably familiar with that. Um, Modern insulation, there's there's a few different types. There's blown in insulation, which is great for older homes because you can get into the cavities and you can get in there and you don't really have to take down the historic uh, materials on the outside or the inside if there is a good cavity. Um, there's rigid insulation, which is um, more of a board that you can put up between the, the spacing and the cavity floor joists. Really good if you can get into your attic and get in from underneath and put that in. And then there's spray insulation, which is what you see on this uh, ceiling here where they spray on the foam and then it expands. It's really, really good because it, you know, it it fills up the space, it's watertight. It's, um, it's very good because rodents can't chew through it. So that's also a consideration when you have an older house where maybe some of the joists aren't exactly uh, completely tight. Um, so typically for a house, unfortunately, you know, you're going to have to insulate either, you're going to have to get in there either from the inside or the outside to insulate. And that's one of the things that you really get, you know, again, when you're going back and forth with that, we've done multiple ways, you know, insulate from the outside, especially roof lines. Um, you can, you know, if you have a finished attic or if you have an attic, that's just so nice looking with the old timbers, the old, you know, you see the skip sheathing you get all the purlings, you know, you really don't, you know, sometimes you might get into it and be like, oh, I don't want to insulate that with spray foam and kind of almost damage those, um, those rafters. There's another thing is that you can go from the outside, you take off your, you know, the asphalt shingles and you actually use the rigid foam, which you can get inch, you can get six inches, and then you actually are insulating from the outside and then you trim, you know, you just get a little bit bulky old roof line and then you do trim on all on the outside. Um, and I think that's kind of the, you know, there's just a lot of different ways to do it. And it's all about your philosophy of, you know, creating a tight house. Um, you know, when you get into the insulation and in, we'll get into windows and doors next, but you, the majority of the time you lose heat rises. So it goes in from the basement, you go up and you go out you know, doesn't go out as much of windows and doors unless you have drafts and you're literally feeling you know, wind coming, you know, back and forth. But, you know, if starting in the basement, insulating that basement, insulating the rim joists, so around, so you have your foundation and your floor joists and their sill are on top of the foundation between the joists, filling it in what Felicia was saying is that, that rigid foam in those spaces prevents that air from coming in, that cold air coming in from below and then getting up into the house, especially keeping your feet warm too. You know, in the basement, using fiberglass insulation instead of spray foam, especially if it's a full basement or something like that, can still preserve the historic value of the um, the floor joists or the rafters in your attic as well. So they, you know, again, talking through with whoever you're working with on, um, on your energy efficiency insulation, you know, keeping a lot of different mind, you know, different aspects in mind as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the one thing with um, the spray is that that is going to be a permanent solution. So you don't really want to spray that onto historic material um, because then that's it. So if you could do a rigid, you know, if you're worried about lath and plaster and preserving that, but you really do need, you know, an extra insulation you know, rigid or blown in is, is probably the way to go. Um, I think there was a question about um, sort of damp um, under areas, either cellars, root cellars and all of that. Um, again, you know, these houses were built on top of these stone basements. You know, there's, there's natural water infiltration. That in itself isn't, um, you know, isn't a structural problem if it's been like that for hundreds of years. The house I grew up in used to be a dairy farm. So they used to store all the cold milk down there because it consistently stayed 55 degrees, even when it was 90 degrees out. Um, and it was wet, you know, um, you could you could have that. But if you insulate the floorboards, 
you know, from underneath that damp, that cold isn't then going to come into the main living areas. So you can still keep your root cellar, your basement, historic, authentic, not have to go through the whole, you know, trouble of water sealing it and maintaining that. Um, but you can still have a, a comfortable house on the inside. Right. I mean, I think when you get into the basements aspects, you know, having a dehumidifier, especially with those, keeping that moisture out, dehumidifiers that run constantly, they have mm -hmm. a little line that gets pumped out. Um, that's always going to keep it better. It's also keeping water away from your house too. You know, okay. it's like, Hey, I have an old house. I want to keep the look of it. I don't want to put gutters on. It's like, I understand that. However, you know, without gutters, your water water is coming off your roof line, coming right down and dropping right next to your foundation. And then water goes where it wants to go. Mm -hmm. So it's going to come through that foundation. It's going to come through there. Um, there's only so much you can do. So getting what, you know, getting gutters, getting water away from the house, making sure your grading is properly. You know, a lot of times you see a lot of garden beds. I go to a lot of jobs where people are like, oh, I've, I've rotted, you know, corner boards or watermark boards and it's because they have probably had 20 years of mulch build up too right. on their side of their house that it's like all right you need to take all this mulch out and start fresh upgrade and then go from there so really trying to keep the water away from the house with gutters and you know a dehumidifier on the basement that constantly runs mm -hmm. um is always the best and this picture is a great picture uh this is a 1690s house as you can see the dirt line you can see the first course of stone for the foundation right so you typically houses are built on stone foundations before concrete. Um, you do not want your dirt line encroaching on that wood sill because that's when you're going to get water intrusion and, and rot and all of that. So you just want to make sure that you take it down. And, and over the years, obviously, 200 years of earth soil build up, it is going to build up. So just regrade that. Um, so this is a good example of all new windows in a historic house. You know, they're 12 over 12 sash windows. They look authentic to the house. Um, the original windows had been taken out and lost years and years ago. Um, this was a replacement of, you know, those those very cheap made aluminum frame windows. So no historic fabric being lost in this replacement. Um, but really, the great thing about uh, windows these days, is if you get good quality windows, they're going to be double paned. They're going to be thermal insulated. You do not need additional storm windows. That is more than enough. They come with their own fitted um screen. So it's all a, a basic in one unit. Um, obviously, we'll be the first to tell you if you have original glass, do not take that out. Um, really use that if you can. Um, and it goes with the, you know, the aspect when you get into that, all right, I want to replace my window. You know, I'm getting the draftiness. All right, well, why is it drafty? Where is it drafty? Um, you know, storm windows are great. They you know, when you get into the insulation, like I said, talk about the heat goes from a base and goes up and goes throughout the attic and goes out. Well, it doesn't go much this way. You're not losing that much, except obviously if you have drafted windows. And that's when it gets into storm windows, saving those old windows, renovating them. You know, we did the old Sabrook Historical Society. We renovated all those windows, made them operable, you know, be, pretty much became single hung. Um, they only work from the bottom, but renovate them. That way they are able to open them. And then the storm opens as well. So you're preserving that wood from the outside and you're still getting that, that historical look. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple of more things about windows and doors. Um, same thing with actual front doors. You know, if you have your wood original front door, putting a full glass door in front of it just to keep that wood um, nice and water safe and tight. Um, Sometimes drafts aren't coming from the windows, they're coming from the sills. You can see all the rot that was buried uh, underneath that sill once you take that trim off. Obviously, you don't want to lose historic trim, but there are ways, you know, if you get somebody who specializes in restorations, they're going to remove that trim delicately, they're going to mark it, they're going to take it so that it can be placed right back on. Um, or they're going to, to have that same profile with new materials. Um, so if you want to do storm windows for, that are fitted from the interior, um, because you have historic glass, um, allied windows or inner glass window systems makes them. They're really good. And then that way you don't have to get up on a ladder, especially on the second floor. And I think the biggest thing with those interior, because you get a lot of historic, um, like historical societies in town, like I know Guilford has one. They don't want storm windows on the outside. It's because it is a look, right? Mm -hmm. You know, once you put storm windows on, it can change the look of the little house, but at the same time, they're very because it's a wood window on the outside and that's you know got to keep maintaining it painting it keeping it mm -hmm. sealed and things like that so that's why you know the interior um 
glass, those interior storms are good. Um, but if you are able to protect that glass and the wood on from the outside with the exterior storm uh, window, you know, that's obviously a little better because the window is going to last a little longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so if you do have, you know, older windows that aren't the historic ones um, that are ready to re be replaced, um, you can get the simulated divided light will give you the look of historic windows. It'll have the mullion on the inside and the outside. That's really, you know, the what you want to go for. Um, if you have egress issues, you can get casement windows that open out that look like they're double hung sashes, sashes windows. So you can um, keep the look of the historic house, but meet all of those building codes and, and safety codes that that are uh, standard these days. Um, so a couple more things about mechanical updates. Um, a lot of people want to know about how to heat an old house, and it certainly can be an issue because you don't have the typical, uh, you know, soffits and cavities to get into. So um, really what you want to do is you want to ask around. You want to get somebody who knows historic houses, who's willing to think outside the box, who isn't just going to sell you that one system that they know how to install and put conduit around the house. Um, we really, really try to stay away from mini splits if we can in historic houses. They're an eyesore. They're a lot of maintenance. Um, you know, they're not that energy efficient. They're room to room. So really, if you can get a heat pump in there and figure out, um, figure out, you know, how to get that in there. Um, that's always ideal, but it's, it's always, you know, if somebody's willing to work with you and willing to work with the old house, um, if you want to expand. Yeah. I mean, that. I think the aspect is mini splits, you know, ever, you know, you get so many people and I've seen a ton, I've seen a lot of historic homes and people come in like, oh yeah, there's nowhere to put ductwork in here. Let's just put some mini splits on the wall and they're good for each room. And, you know, they're on the wall They're you know, they have to go kind of on the outside, um, you know, unfortunately that, you know, in the end it is what you have to do sometimes, but it's really, you know, making sure you talk to someone that isn't just going to sell you one thing, you know, it's, uh, you know, you get duck work, duck work in areas, you know, heat pumps, it's, there's so much that goes around with it, you know, with, especially with old houses and solar, um, you know, you get some people like, oh, well, I need a new house or I need everything, you know, kind of. I guess redone on the inside of the attic to hold up solar panels. Solar panels don't weigh very much. You know, those the they're just protecting their own warranty. You know, and I think it's that aspect making sure a structural engineer comes in or, you know, some builder that knows what they're doing comes in. Structural engineers try to again sometimes go too far as well. Um, so unfortunately it's just one of those, you know, trusting your contractor and who's going to come in and pretty much say, no, you're fine. You can put it up there. Um, and it's really not going to add too much weight to your to mm -hmm. your building. And an, an exciting new advance in solar technology that we're actually seeing on new homes. Um, we're installing our first one um, in a couple of months is instead of the large solar panels that are a couple of feet wide, they're doing tiles that look somewhat like roofing tiles, but they're much smaller and you cover the whole roof in that. So it's less of an eyesore, it's less weight. Um, you don't have, you know, if a tile gets damaged, you replace the tile, you don't have to replace the whole panel. You don't have to do those extra fastening onto it. So that's something to look into too, you know. Um, certain solar companies do that. Uh, I wish I could remember off the top of my head the name of this solar company, but- um, well, Most of those roofing, even roofing out. companies are coming out too, like mm -hmm. GAF. Um, shingles they're coming out with a solar shingle you know mm -hmm. they're following tesla as the lead where they have you know tesla has their shingles now all the other roofing companies are coming out with their own as well so mm -hmm. you know solar is a whole nother aspect that um you know don't put it on the front of your house i would just say <laughs> you know it takes away from the look of it but that's more of a personal thing um so you know trying to keep trying to and there's a lot of different things and a lot of different materials as well, you know, especially with your roof. Um, if you want to go back to the first photo um, or. And we'll get into roof lines. In there'll be roof lines. <laughs> we'll talk about roof lines oh. in a little bit. Um, but yeah, with sustainable upgrades and everything like that, it's, it's always the give and take of, you know, the historic fabric versus the environmental concerns and the energy upgrades. Um, and just making sure that whatever you do to be environmentally conscious isn't taking away from the historic fabric because the, the thing about historic buildings is that um, intrinsically they're very sustainable because 
they're materials that already exist. You're not, you know, putting them into landfills. You're not mining new materials, you know, so, so you have that. Um, this is a great photo. This is the inside of the Stone Shelley house. Uh, you can see all of the boards and the rot that was happening, but you could see the bones of the structure is still there. Um, so part of the renovation was, was keeping all of those wooden timbers, stripping off all the old lead paint, all of that damage, sistering in where we needed to, and then going ahead and insulating on the inside of the house. And then uh, what we did is we did a plaster coat on top of that insulation to um, bring back the character of what the original lath and plaster would have been. Um, and we also exposed all of the fieldstone fireplaces and, and all of that. So that was a and trenched into the basement so that we could get some mechanicals in. Obviously, with a lot of houses, they're not in this condition, so you don't want to get that drastic. But if you have a house, um, you know, in this condition, uh, you have the opportunity to to do what you need to do. Um, so let's see. So that's that's a bit on mechanical updates. Um, these are a couple of different bathrooms. You know, just to give you a reminder of all the stuff that has to get in behind the walls. If you look um, at the first slide, you know, that's shower valves, that's hot water, cold water, sewage valves, elbow, all of that needs to get in to make a functional shower, right? Um, so building out those new walls. And then it's all about materials you pick. Um, again, with interior additions, you know, a couple of questions on kitchens and bathrooms, and I'll explain on this later as an interior designer. There's the purists that that want, you know, authentic kitchens and bathrooms. But if you're if you're living in a Victorian house, a colonial house, you know, our concept of a modern kitchen and a modern bathroom obviously didn't exist with before indoor plumbing. So really the best way to to integrate those modern conveniences is, is to just pick the classic finishes, the subway tiles, the penny tiles, you know, don't take up more space than you need to, but really stick classically with the design elements to make it feel like it's part of your house, but you're never going to get an authentic kitchen or bath because they didn't exist back then, aside from outhouses. And one of the things that you could see here as well, you know, talk about mechanicals and plumbing. Um, I see a lot in older houses when you go in and so that was renovated in the 70s, 80s or something like that, even earlier, you actually get a step up into a bathroom um, because the plumbing is obviously so different now. And, you know, plumbing, you have four inch you know, septic pipe, and then you have the trap that goes underneath it. Well, sometimes the floor joists are only about six inches. And so the trap sometimes actually will go below the ceiling and then into your first floor ceiling. It's like, well, well I got plumbing now. And, and so that's why you, used to, you see steps up where they actually create more space. They get more traps. They can move plumbing around. And so it's thinking, you know, outside the box. It's like, all right, well, how can we move things around? How can you put you know, can you put a toilet on the exterior or on in the inside wall and hang it versus putting, you know, so there's a lot of things to think about with older houses that maybe you don't, you know, you don't have to think about with, you know, a newer house that was built from 1980s on or 70s on, you know, you get those, you get enough room. You know, even in, in 1970s, 80 kitchens, they still put, you know, you see a lot of kitchens that have soffits, then the cabinets go up to it. Well, usually in those soffits, that's the septic line going down mm -hmm. um and that that's what it's hiding so you know we're, we're doing kitchens all the time now and we're having to redo and move plumbing and to be able to gain that space so it's always always an issue and obviously a little bit more um with an older house mm -hmm. yeah a lot of the time when you walk into a house and you say why would you hide these beams you know with the drop ceiling well because they needed to hide plumbing and hvac and all of that and so you know sometimes the drop ceiling is the only way you could do that um but there's creative ways to do it that make it look authentic or at least intentional. That's that's always the goal, right? Making never take it the, intentional. Never, yeah, never take the easy way. There's always ways to make things look a little better. Yeah. Um, so moving on to sympathetic additions. Again, this is the back of the Stone Shelley house. Um, so with your historic house, you have your own unique little time capsule, you know, multiple different generations. Maybe it was built in the colonial era, but, you know, large Victorian additions or craftsman additions or anything. Um, you know, it's it's kind of fun, especially New England houses, you know, to see them added on over the generations. And sometimes outboxes or outbuildings have been incorporated and, and taken in. Um, so, but also, you know, you need to... Um, you need to incorporate modern living spaces. So with the Stone Shelley house, it was a salt box house, had very low ceilings to begin with. Can you hide that? Um, and so 
what happened is this addition. So what you see here with the hip roof is a modern kitchen in a modern primary suite addition, which made the house infinitely more livable, brought in a lot of natural light, brought in higher head heights, um, much more storage capabilities, but still kept the character of the house. Um, I'll show you a few more pictures in a little bit. From the street facing side, it was still the original uh, view. We kept the original roof lines, but added onto it. And so things like that, how can you add on and make it more livable and, and increase the usability of the house, but still maintain its character? Um, just a few other, um, you know, pictures. So this is the roof line. So you can see the original salt box roof line that went, you know, almost all the way down into a wood storage shed. And then you could see where it was added on. Again, sort of using the same vernacular, using the same design cues to make it all look um, consistent. And so purists would say, you know, don't do that to your house. Um, but well, the biggest thing is that, the, you know, get the with the National Trust for Historic Preservation and those um, uh, interior standards mm -hmm. um they pretty much state that if it's going to be an addition on an older house it needs to look like it it's a new addition mm -hmm. and can't have the same materials it needs to look look, look different where with the residential side it's making sure that it belongs not making it feel like a pimple on this house like oh well, look at that they just added that on but that doesn't make any sense it doesn't you know, it doesn't go with the house. And, you know, from, you know, people pretty much on this, probably um, this presentation can understand and look at this house and be like, yeah, that's an addition, but it goes well with the rest of the house. I think the aspect is that you don't want it to just look completely separate, different building, just because you want to really be like, all right, yeah, they added an addition, but it was a nice addition that made the house bigger and made it house more functional for today's age. Um, but it didn't demo or take away from the older house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and in doing this addition, we also took off some additions that didn't fit the history of the house. Um, so I interned at the Paul Revere house. And if you know anything about the history of that, when they first bought the Paul Revere house, it looked like any other boarding house in mass in Boston, you wouldn't have known that it was colonial structure underneath. So removing all of the additional, you know, they were getting back to a very specific period in time and a very specific footprint. Um, but sometimes I, I have another slide. Sometimes there are additions that don't match the character of the house and don't, um, comply with building codes. And so taking those off and using um, using that opportunity to create something that that maybe does go a little bit better with the house. Um, this is another example. This is, you know, sort of um, your typical Greek um, farmhouse. Uh, in this case, it had had multiple renovations throughout the generations. Uh, you could see the porch on the side that was added sometime in the 1920s. And then you see the, the roof line in the back. That was a 1990s edition with the garage. And what we came along and did is incorporated um, a sun room and a mud room to, to connect the garage to the main living spaces. Again, off the back of the house. But as you can see, we took the same scale. We took some of the same design cues to incorporate it into the house. Um, looked at the roof lines and just made sure that, you know, it, it was sympathetic. It looked like it belonged um and it increased you know their enjoyment of the house exponentially um and then so a couple other things um just maintaining architectural style so right on the right hand side you can see the before and after that's an example of taking away an unsympathetic addition um and restoring the original um portion of the house um I think the Stone Shelly house is a great example because as you can see from the aerial view right next door, there is a house of also a historic vintage. Um, but I don't think by looking at that house, you would know that that was a house uh, that was built in the late 1700s. Um, the very back portion has, you know, this beautiful stone um, foundation, but then it's been added onto. And, you know, the front of the office is that sort of 1980s postmodernist geometric um that that just in my opinion modern design doesn't belong meshed up with historic houses you know it it can be great on its own and it has a place but but it really doesn't 
cohesively uh, work with historic foundations. So just kind of trying to think, um, you know, be mindful of the scale and the openings and and what materials you're using as well. A lot of houses that you see that you can't quite put a finger on it, why that house doesn't look historic or beautiful, it's because the windows have been scaled down or made smaller um, because that was more affordable or cheaper, you know, way to do it. So it's really keeping in mind the materials you're using. Don't always go for the quick, cheap fix because, you know, it, it's going to read as inappropriate for the house. Yeah. And then you also talk about the materials. You can see the Stone Shelley house. Um, and actually the house on the right has architectural shingles, um, asphalt architectural shingles. Um, you know, actually the Stone Shelley house, you're like, okay, that might, you know, that looks like cedar roof. Um, but it's not actually. It's Enviro Shakes, which is a, um, it's a recycled material that it actually has a warranty, I believe, of at least 50 years. And that was because they had to put a warranty on it at some point. Um, they actually did simulations where it can last up to 100 years. It's recycled tires. But when you drive by and you see the other photos, it looks like a nice old roof. Um, and so when you get into what, you know, what Felicia was just talking about is the materials. Well, that, you know, instead of putting an asphalt roof on there, that's going to be like, oh, okay, you're kind of just kind of, put it in obviously money and budget always comes into the aspect the cedar roof is going to be expensive but it's only going to last 25 years and cedar is not what it used to be now with enviro shake it's a recycled material and it's about the same cost as cedar roof and it's going to last so much longer and still give you that look we've done this on multiple houses in town um, it's on the front of my office thus the 1733 um Phineas Meg's house in Madison. We've done it on an old farmhouse. Uh, we've done it on a town property on Bauer Farmhouse. Um, and they, it looks it looks tremendous. So it's always kind of one of those things is there's so many different materials out there and really kind of just instead of just going to the one aspect, look at the different options as well. Even slate roofs. They have slate that's actually um, a recycled material as well that looks very good. We've done that on one house as well. Um, so, you know, instead of spending the slate material, I know that gets really expensive, but you know, there's different, different options. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so then moving on into interior alterations, um, again, it's sort of, it's, it's all about your philosophy. You know, do you want to stay as true to the house or do you want to, to make it, you know, livable for you? Um, you know, we do draw the line sometimes, you know, it's, it's always different with every house, but there are certain things that we're not willing to remove or, or take place. Um, this is in the Stone Helly Shelley house. So as we were talking about, um, sort of making your addition feel like it belongs with the rest of the house, the original house stops at that ceiling beam. Uh, and the house, the addition is the kitchen portion of it. But as you can see, it sort of all flows cohesively together. Same materials, same design cues, same style. This is a repurposed kitchen. This kitchen is made of 300 year old boards. Unfortunately, um, they got painted, not by us. Um, so I just worked with the color palette and, and lightened that up. But a very functional kitchen um, with, you know, historic materials, that soapstone counters. Um, so they have a lovely patina things like that. So it's it's a blend of traditional materials, but modern day conveniences and function um, that went into that. And that's the whole aspect really with this whole homes is we're not, again, going back, you know, being purist preservation, you need all this stuff to be exactly the way. And it's like, well, we have modern plumbing, we have, you know, gas stove, stove top ranges, we have 36 inch refrigerators, microwaves, you know, and so it's really all incorporating in how you use it, you know, and that's, you know, Felicia mentioned in the beginning that we actually do build our own cabinetry as well. You know, a 24 inch cabinet that you kind of standard boxes, well, we could build a 22 and a half inch. That's exactly the same cost as us building a 24 inch because it fits better in the space. There's a lot more cab cavities in older houses. Maybe you're able to, you know, take up some space in, you know, and so it all depends on the design and that's really making sure you think about it when you're working, you know, unfortunately, you know, you get some people that you're like, Hey, I want all everything open. It's like, well, you bought a 1700 house. You're, why are you buying a 1700 house? If you want everything on the first floor open, that doesn't really work. You have to work with and exactly what um, 
you know, Felicia mentioned is having, you know, being stewards of the space, not take away everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and like, just like here, um, what you show is like, we put a, you know, putting a laundry room on the second floor, but really kind of making it flow with the space. This is an attic that we reclaimed cathedral and ceiling. You used um, rigid foam in between the rafters and left the rafters exposed um, just to try to gain as much space as we could up there. We kept the floor, um, you know, and just sanded it down, gave it a new paint job um, and made a really nice added, office. And you can see that, and yeah. you added skylights to bring in light. You can see the cabinetry um, in the back of this picture um, that really kind of fit with the angle. Um, and so really trying to make make everything you work in this in the current space mm -hmm. right and it, it's about recapturing space where you can unused addict eaves you know mechanical spaces as technology gets better and mechanical equipment gets smaller and more efficient do you need a huge boiler room no you could retake that um you know building built-ins into eave walls things like that um again this is a hallway pass through but because the laundry is is nice to look at, you can keep it out in the open. Um, so this is an example of dormering out the roof, right? And and making usable bedroom spaces in the front of the house, whereas before it was just one um, very crammed space. But it keeps the original roof line, keeps the uh, sort of style and feeling of the house and the scale of it, but makes it much more usable. Um, so then a little bit on the style notes, which is which is where I really like to um, incorporate is incorporating, you know, some of the historic elements in the house. Some some houses are really rich in that and have all the original paneling. Some, unfortunately, have been sort of depleted of that. Um, so really, you know, taking taking what is historic and highlighting that. Um, when designing bathrooms and kitchens, I kind of like to look around and understand the history of the house. You know, the Stone Shelley house is a very early colonial. It's got more of a rustic. So the kitchen was a little more rustic. Whereas if it were, um, you know, an 1880s Victorian or anything like that, I would do a little bit more refined of a kitchen, make it furniture-like. Um, you know, English kitchens have more of that, that furniture-like style. They're really interesting to look at. It's less cabinetry. It's more standalone pieces. That works really well with sort of Victorian era houses. Um, some of the kitchens in Newport are really great in some of the um, cottages, <laughs> so to speak, um, that they have in Newport. Um, if you go down to there, you can see huge work tables that are, you know, the predecessors to the current islands we have. So, so taking that in, you know, if you can find a historic piece like a sideboard or a work table and incorporate it in, into your kitchen design, again, it's it's about having pieces that fit into the house instead of just trying to make, you know, out of the box fit into your historic house. Um, and again, that model of, of do no harm, right? So that the interior, the one on the left, you could see sort of where some lath and plaster was taken off of um, you could see a little bit of the striping, right? That's from where the plaster was. Kept that because we like that texture. They never would have exposed that back in the day because they would have thought it was, you know, unsightly and unfinished and, you know, um, all of that. But we as historians like to see the components of the house. But then you have the the later edition um, turned um, banisters that that are kept. And then, you know, a, another addition of how do you get storage in there? Well, you know, we we created a, a storage that is only mounted onto the beams and mounted into the sidewalls. Um, none of that shelving is drilled into that stone, so it can easily be removed and it's like nothing was ever there. But for this particular case, you know, they wanted more storage and display area. Um, again, interesting ways to do a modern bath or, you know, convenience of a modern bathroom without taking away some of the um, original historic features in there and just really sort of working with the vernacular and the design cues of your house, highlighting the woodwork, highlighting, you know, the large floorboards. Um, I think my next slide. If you could actually go back real quick, I'll, I'll, I'll actually explain another one. The one on the right, those beams, that's a summer beam going into the fireplace. Um, that was all painted pink mm -hmm. when we got that house. Um, so that all had to get stripped down back to the original wood. So obviously labor intensive mm -hmm. um, versus 
you know, oh, just take it all out and get rid of it. It's like, well, no, just take some time, strip that paint off and you get such a nice, um, nice old look. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, and you can see the hatchet marks also in that, right. which, you know, just added character instead of just covering that with drywall or covering that with trim, you know, taking the time to do all that. Um, this is another style of house, right? This is, this is a much more refined style of house. This is the, a Greek, you know, Victorian era. So um, some coffered moldings, all of that. This actually, this house was completely gutted and renovated and, and had no authentic um, historic fabric on the inside of the house. So it's just kind of, how do you bring in that charm of an old house without trying to, you know, create a false sense of history? Um, that and then of course my my plea to everyone is just save the floors there's nothing like old floors this is you know tulip wood floors some of them are 18 inches wide you can see the hatchet marks and all that they have to be refinished by hand because they've been you know sanded down so many times but to us that that's the type of feature that's really worth it so um just to wrap up sort of the design think about your color and pattern you know back um back before synthetic um, colors and true white paint, you know, they had really earthy um, color palettes because that's what you could do with natural dyes and everything like that. Um, think about what trim, you know, sometimes they did white wash walls with, with colored trim, things like that. Um, you know, sometimes if you do have a lack of natural light, light and bright is the way to go. You could see the same room with different uh, paint features. Um, really makes a huge difference. Again, that's more about personal taste, but there are ways to decorate a house that make it feel light and bright and welcoming, but still retain the character. Um, again, up here, it's just, it's an example of using color. You know, not everything has to be white and beige. You can use color and color works really well with historic houses because originally that's what they would have probably had until you get into the late 1800s when you had the city beautiful and everything was white. Um, wallpaper again is a really historic feature, um, that would be authentic to it. And, um, there's ways to play with it and incorporate it in. So there's some paint sources, you know, old village paint, Pharaoh and Ball is a British paint company, um, that does different paints. And then you can get wallpaper, um, you know, authentic wood blocking. Cole and Son has been around since 1875, but, you know, they're darlings of, of, the modern design world, same thing with Morris and Cow. So a couple of sources there. So um, I think that's the end. Oh, and architectural salvage sources just for New England. Monger's Market down in Bridgeport. It's only open on Sundays, but it's huge, really interesting. Um, Northeast Architectural Antiques up in New Hampshire also um, gets a lot of really interesting salvage if you're looking for kitchen pieces. They get some of the bigger pieces. And then down in New York, old good things, you know, if you're looking for light fixtures or doorknobs or hardware, you can go down to them um, for all of that. So I will stop my share. Um, I hope that was interesting. And um, we're happy to open it up to some questions if you wanted us to kind of get more in depth on things. Yeah, or... I mean, I think that, you know, the kind of an overview of the whole aspect is this, you know, there's so much with old houses and what you can and can't do. And, you know, it's trying to really just, you know, make sure and think about and get the different options and different people's perspectives, um, you know, using the Connecticut Trust, using Jane, using everyone, the circuit riders, um, you know, and having them, you know, I'm not sure exactly, you know, she can go more in, you know, what they offer um, with tax credits and things like that. That's more of on the commercial side. I, you know, I don't not, not I don't know enough about all those. Uh, I know there's a question about the tax credits and what you can and can't do. Um, so it's, it's just one of those aspects. There's a lot of things that you can do. Um, you know, I think that's all I got right now. Yeah. Thank you, Felicia and Travis. Um, and I love that your philosophy is to really try to follow the Secretary of the Interior Standards, whether it's required or not um, <laughs> for grants and for tax credit. You know, you have to follow those standards and get you know approval from the State Historic Preservation Office and the National Park Service. But I love that you use that to guide your decision making on all of your projects. And then that shows the range of interpretations and the sensitivity to each project and taking in the considerations of each project. 
And yeah, I mean, there's just so much, there's so many options to go with. And you, when you go through that, it's usually, you know, it's a guy, when you get in the residential side, it's usually as a guideline um, and, you know, try to apply it as much as you can. That way you're not re, you know, trying to, you know, you're tearing something down or you're taking something out that really can't replace and no one's going to know about. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that piqued my interest is um, on the Shelley house, the roofing material. Yeah. Um, we get a lot of questions about, Enviro shakes and you know substitute materials like that, but we've always been wondering, well, how is that going to weather? What you know, what how mm -hmm. is it going to perform? So mm -hmm. knowing that you have these sites in Madison where we can yeah, see, yeah. I think there's how four, they've held up. I think there's five buildings we've done in in town that have the Enviro shakes, um, and they silver out. You know, obviously when you first install them, they can, but they you know it gives that texture, it gives that look, it gives that you know it, it starts to go away um, we try to push you know people who are looking like hey i really want cedar roof you knowing everything we're doing cedar is just not the way it was you know especially in the price it's just going way up with mm -hmm. all those wildfires out west um you know and think about you know, like you know in the environment we do it too you know mm -hmm. think about all the machinery everything that's got to travel it's coming from british columbia it's coming from out west um, you know, and using recycled materials, it's going to last a hundred years. Right. Yeah. And cedar, you know, it's younger wood. Everything these days is younger wood. You don't get that tight grain. So it's going to wear much faster. Um, I think the last pricing I did, I think Enviro Shakes are about 20% more. But if you think about that, you're going to get two or three um, more roof life expectancy. I think the warranty is actually up to 75 years now. So if you replace a cedar roof every 30 years, um, and the thing that I really um, like about them is they look authentic in the rain as well. Sometimes you get these materials that when they're exposed to water, you can kind of tell, you know, um, that they're different um, or not, not authentic. Um, but in the rain, in the snow, you know, the, the Enviro shakes look just like cedar shakes. You can get them in two different shades of color. Um, so they're a really good, you know, opportunity. And then there is a house in Guilford that has the solar tiles on the roof. It is a colonial center stack chimney house. Um, you can tell that it's not a regular roof, but, um, you know, the tiles really don't take away. It's not a glaring, huge solar panel um, that's shiny. So it's, it's a really nice way to sort of toe that line between being environmentally caught conscious and sustainable, but still respecting the history um, of the house and the view and the streetscape um, that's been there for, for, you know, hundreds of years and multiple generations. Um, to touch on sort of how to learn more about historic preservation and, and historic styles, honestly, I think the best thing to do, you know, you can get a few reference guides, you know, what style is it, but unless it's a real, you know, like statement house it's not going to stick to you know one style and stay within those rigid guidelines of this is what a craftsman has you know a lot of houses just like they are today it's it's what the owner thought was attractive um so what we really like to do is we just like to find um you know historic towns that have a really good you know housing stock and take a walk around and look at the neighborhood and you know you start to see okay that porch has that detail and that porch has that detail and and they're sort of similar, but somebody ripped off of them differently. And, oh, isn't that interesting that that house took, you know, those windows and combined it with those windows. And you start to see, and if you get stuck, if you're renovating a house and you get stuck, especially with color palettes, what I tend to do is, is find a neighborhood that has houses similar in style to the house that you're doing and just see what other people have done. You know, you can always go back to historic paint references and all of that, but a lot of it is just training your eye to see historic houses and and you can start to read them too. You can start to, you know, I love going down into basements because I can kind of look and I could say, oh, that beam's different and that's there. And, and you start to piece together how the house evolved and how it was put together. And um, that can be really fun. It, it, it almost becomes its own language that you can start to decode the more you just sort of, um, you know, immerse yourself in it. Um, David has his hand raised. Yeah. Go ahead and ask a question. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I live in Brooklyn, Connecticut, and um, I'm just outside of the historical district, and I've been doing renovations on my home. Um, I've been living here about 15 years, and 
It was one of three built in 1936 by Alexander Powdrell, um, a prominent mill owner. But my question is, if if I could get some kind of um, monetary or tax incentives, what would I have to do? I would have to, uh, my understanding is, get on the Connecticut Register. But being just outside the Brooklyn Historical District, they would have to, it would have to be, it's quite a challenge, I would imagine, because I'd have to be in that district to get that type of rebate, right? I, was well, just I think that's going to be more of a Jan type of question. With <laughs> right. yeah. So that's where our circuit rider team comes in. Uh, we can make a site visit to your um, property, David, and see um, what the integrity of the site is. And we um, correspond with the State Historic Preservation Office to see if there's eligibility for you to be included in the state or national register, either as a standalone property or as an addition to the district. Okay. Was there someone I could get in touch with on that to, to have them come by? Yep. I think Stacy on our call would be the closest one to you. See? Sure. Be happy. Happy to. Um, my email, I think, is in the beginning of this presentation, but I can give it to you now if you'd like. Sure, that'd be great. It is S is in Sam, V is in Victor, A I R O at preservationct.org. And I'll okay, just thank add you. To that. Thanks. I'll get up on my soapbox a little bit as a historic preservationist. Is um we really like houses that are on the register and on the national register. A lot of people think that if your house is on the national register or part of a historic district, you're going to be handcuffed to certain rules. That's not always necessarily the case. Um, in a lot of places, that isn't the case at all. It's just sort of um, suggestions. Um, and a lot of times it, it just helps you get more funding or, or more opportunities to to maintain the history of your house instead of you know everybody's worried that they're never going to be able to paint the house the color they want or that's that's rarely the case especially in Connecticut in New York definitely you get into some of those stricter guidelines but in Connecticut if you become part of a historic district it's not going to um, prevent you from you know living in your house and, and renovating it just really just make it just makes you kind of keep the exterior and getting you know a little another opinion making sure you're sympathetic to the existing house you know unfortunately in the interior you could strip down all the walls and make it all open and do anything you want to it uh, but you know at least at the exterior you're able to you know keep it maintained yep yep that's correct the state and national register are honorific designations and so there are no regulations associated with that unless you use that designation to help you get a tax credit or a grant or something. And then you'll have some um, guidelines that you'll need to follow. Local historic districts are the ones that have review and you have to get a certificate of appropriateness from a town commission. And th those are very specific. We have a website, lhdct.org that Preservation Connecticut maintains. So if you wanted to check on your local historic district and make sure to see if you're in a national district or a local district, um, we can assist you with that information as well. So it's just the, the designated local historic districts that really have the, the purview over what you do on your exterior. Yeah, and those can vary widely. So it's, it's not necessarily, you know, I know a lot of people get scared off by that, but it doesn't have to be the case. Right. It's meant to be encouraging you to be good stewards. <laughs> exactly. Yes. All right. Um, I think that's our time, but we're happy to to take Is any one other. One more questions? quick hand, Bill. Yeah. Yes. One yes. More. Please. Thank you. So I work with the Brantford Land Trust, and we're uh, and about to engage in a a major uh, rehabilitation project. We have a, a one room schoolhouse built in 1865. It's built on a. Uh, a granite block foundation and it has lots of holes in the in the granite block so it breathes nicely it's on a crawl space the crawl space is wet uh, water gets in there both i think uh, subsurface water as well as <clears throat> uh, groundwater so we need to fix those issues but uh, we we're about to uh, the, our perspective was to seal it up nice and tight um, rehab the windows rehab the doors insulate it 
um, insulate the, the attic, put some ventilation in the attic, and we had an insulation guy come in, uh, seems to be a pretty credible guy, and he brought in another expert, and he said, you either have to spend tens of thousands of dollars to reduce the moisture, control the moisture in the crawl space, um, or don't do any insulation at all. We don't use the building very often. It's We use it for meetings once a month, uh, I'm sorry, once a week at most. So is it worth spending tens of thousands of dollars to try to dehumidify and then seal it up and insulate, or should we just let it breathe? One of our my committee members said that the reason why these old buildings are still standing is that they breathe. The water, the air blows in and out and the, and the structure survives that way. You start sealing it up and insulating it. Um, and in particular, if you don't ventilate it enough, then you're going to get rot and mildew. Yeah, I mean, I, right. I mean, I think the aspect is, I think we always think it's, you know, as builders, it's kind of crazy though. They, they make all these building codes and they're like, okay, great. Now you need to put a vent in so that way you get fresh air. And you're like, wait, what? You're making it so tight that you actually have to bring fresh air in. You know, I think the aspect is with that, um, you can kind of go, you know, kind of go both ways. I mean, obviously, if you're not using that much, it's a little bit different. Obviously, heating and efficiency is huge. You're not going to try to, you know, heat the place up to 65 all your winter, winter, and, you know, you're just wasting all that electricity or energy. Um, yep. You know, you could always insulate the floor and let the basement breathe, you know, maybe not seal everything up, you know, have a dehumidifier running if you need to, some pump really make sure gutters are on there. But maybe just it's just insulating the floor, you know, closed cell foam. Um, if you did closed cell, that doesn't allow any moisture penetration. Um, open cell foam does allow moisture penetration, so it can go through there. So maybe it's like two inches of, you know, sprayed closed cell foam in the floor joists to maybe warm the feet pretty much um, while letting the basement breathe. Uh, maybe that's the way to do it. Shippo will not, we, we're getting a grant from Shippo that will not allow spray foam insulation. Yeah, so that's uh, that's good. I didn't know they did. They they're not allowed that. What's up with that, Jane? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> well, it, it's it, not reversible. Yeah, exactly. I know, and that's and that's that's the aspect. You get these different, you know, and get. I mean, I agree then with that because you know fiberglass gets moldy, it gets all that type of stuff. You right. know, keep that moisture. And that's a hard one. You know, I think because, you know, I think especially with a place like yourself, you know, you're dealing with is, you know, budgets are big and big, you know, you don't want to be, you know, spending that much money on something that you really is not going to get used all the time. Um, yeah. So. yeah, that's that's one of the, you know, when I say we don't recommend mini splits, that's when, you know, you're living in a house pretty much daily. Right. And you can be the person who knows, you know, empty the dehumidifier, you know, keep on top of it. But if it's a space that, you know, you're only going to be in once a month, um, really, I think the best thing to do is, is as little as possible because it's survived mm -hmm. intact the way it is. Let you know, you could let it breathe, put a mini split in there. You know, it's going to be a little cold. Go in, you know, half an hour before your meeting and turn it on, that type of thing, or remote control it. Um, and then that way, you know, you don't have to constantly be checking in on it. You know, we have a few... We have a few buildings in our town that um, that aren't occupied and that the town owns and our sort of, you know, our stance on them is is to just kind of let them be unless there's major structural issues or an ongoing leak, but just let them be because honestly, until somebody is ready to keep an eye on it every day, that's probably the best way to ensure that they're going to last as long as they can. Um, when you start adding in, you know, insulation and half halfway solutions, somebody has to be on top of it. Yep. Thank you for that. And uh, Joe, uh, one uh, quick uh, uh, comment about EnviroShakes. I've been looking into them for uh, uh, where I live, and EnviroShakes um, run about six fifty a square, and Cedar's running over a thousand dollars a square. Pressure treated cedar, so EnviroShake is cheaper. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure it's probably it's been going up and up. We haven't priced it out in probably another over a year, but Cedar, yeah, Cedar is getting crazy. Yep. And a uh, Euro Shield is the rubber one. That, Euro Shield. Uh, Euro Shield is rubber, and Faro Shake is a 95% composite. It's composite, uh, so. 
Yeah. yeah. And I'm really, really enthusiastic about trying to use that. So yeah, I agree. Is somehow to, uh, to get some um, roofs out in Madison that we can look at and how yeah. do contact, um, contact you? 25 Wall Street is my office. Wall? Yeah. The front of the house has an shake. 248 Boston Post Road. That's that Stone Shelly house in Madison. You could drive by. Mm -hmm. It's right on Boston Post Road. Um, and then the Bar Bauer Farm um, has it on uh, Cops Road in Madison. Um, what was that? Cox Road? Cops Road. C-O-P-S-E. Cops Road. C -O -P -S -E, Cops Road. Um, that's Bauer Farm is owned by the town of Madison as well. So huh. their barn and the house has them. The, the house has... Is, um, but yeah, no, they, that way you get both looked at everything. Mm -hmm. And Bauer Farm is a great example for your particular case because Bauer Farm is one of those hands-off properties where the roof was replaced just to make sure it was watertight, but that house is not insulated. It is not heated or cooled, um, so it just breathes on its own, which is why um, the paint uh, is a little um, chipping and all of that, but it's, it's a well well-preserved house because it can breathe um Is that b-o-w-e-r b-a-u-e-r bauer farm yeah okay it was donated to the town historical or donated to i think it's a land trust it's its own but yeah Beautiful. So uh, is it possible for us to contact you about uh, uh, the land trust house? Sure. Yeah. Give us a, uh, yeah, I'll give you, I'll just type in the chat my, or, or your email. <laughs> contact in the chat. Beautiful. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Felicia and Travis. This was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of good information. Well, hopefully. Yeah, thanks for having <laughs> us. This is great. As you can see, we're we're very excited about historic houses and we have a real passion for it. So we're happy to always talk about them. Well, we appreciate your time and your expertise today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. Bye, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye. 0996615. Company.